All right, folks, we're, um, we're ready to start. It's good to see everybody who's here. We're glad that you came out tonight. And um, don't forget that we do have <laughs> coffee, decaf, and fruit over here. Um, we appreciate the fruit lady. Thank you, Lisa. Um, we're... Nah. <laughs> he didn't help. <laughs> he held the door. And we we appreciate you both. Um, but we're we're studying uh, Joseph and his life and how he overcame a lot of odds to be victorious in his life. We're using um, several chapters from the. Uh, from Genesis, so tonight we're looking at chapter 39, primarily, and um, I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I want to, while you're turning to Genesis chapter 39, want to just uh, remind you that if you have not turned in the baby bottles for the PD Pregnancy Resource Center, uh, they are due, so please uh, turn those in. By Sunday, if you have those. Um, also, tomorrow is soup kitchen day. So if you would like to help with the soup kitchen, we will meet over there um, uh, around 1130. And that's in Hamlet. And we will serve from 12 until 1. That's tomorrow in Hamlet at the soup kitchen. Before we begin our lesson, let's bow for a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for this evening, for this time to be together with your people, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, to study your word in your house. And Father, we just lift up the children, the youth, and all who are meeting elsewhere in the building tonight and all their leaders and ask that you would be with them in a special way and guide them to have a better knowledge and love for you. Now as we Continue to look at Joseph's life and how we too can can live victoriously even amid uh, bad circumstances and, and, and unfortunate events and, and even evil that's committed against us, Lord. Help us to, to just see that, that there is hope and that we do have a God who, who takes what was meant for evil and, and, and brings about good. Lord, we pray now that as you Guide us in this time that we would have uh, hearts that hear what you have to say and lives that are obedient. Uh, when we leave this place, that we would go out and apply what you show us. Lord, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. Okay. Um, this is probably the most famous not one of the most famous temptations that's recorded in the Bible. Uh, temptation is inevitable for all people. We will all be tempted. And even Jesus himself was tempted, though he did not sin. Um, there's a verse of scripture, I think, that is helpful to us in understanding um, what, what we can do in the face of temptation. And that's in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Hebrews 4, 15. If somebody would like to read that, I think it would give us a little bit of insight. Hebrews 4, 15. Four fifteen was that fifteen verse fifteen? Okay. So we have a high priest who is. I was thinking there was something else in that verse, but but we have a high priest who is 
sympathetic. He understands. And that high priest, of course, is Jesus Christ. He understands what we're going through when we're tempted because he was tempted. And so he provides the, the grace, the mercy that we need to help us in times of need. And we can be forever grateful for that. That, you know, he's not some Shylock looking down saying, oh, you can't do that, you shouldn't have done that, you really messed up. He's someone who understands temptation and he sympathizes with us when we mess up. Now, through Christ's own example of resisting temptation, uh, he helps us understand how we too can overcome temptation. Jesus quoted scripture each time Satan tempted him. He quoted scripture. Now, this was the Lord Jesus. He was there at creation. This is God. And he quoted scripture. Let that sink in. If we think we can resist temptation on our own, we're wrong. If the Lord Jesus himself used scripture to resist temptation, what better thing for us to do than to memorize scripture? We, we read about this in in Matthew 4, 4, in Matthew 4, 7, in Matthew 4, 10. Each time Satan tempted him, Jesus quoted scripture to him. And that's how he was able to withstand, to resist temptation. Um, we need to know the Bible, just plain and simple. And part of the Bible we need to no, I think, is, is here in the 39th chapter of Genesis. And we see three principles here that we should follow if we want to resist temptation. Now, the first we read is to emulate Joseph's integrity. Look at verses 1 through 6. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. You remember, this was after he had been thrown in the pit. They were going to kill him, his brothers were, and then they decided they'd sell him instead because they could make a little money off of him. They sold him to these Midianites, these Ishmaelites. Now, the Ishmaelites have sold him uh, off again. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. He did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. So, Joseph, Joseph was put in charge of so much right away as the master of Potiphar's house to run things. And 
the Lord, because of that, blessed Potiphar and his home. The Lord, um, because Joseph was a good man, Joseph was a godly man. And so the Lord blessed Potiphar as a result. And Potiphar trusted him completely and never had to um, never had to ask, what do I have? He knew that Joseph was in charge, and all he worried about was what he would eat, what he got to eat each day. Now, Joseph had been envied by his brothers, who, as we talked about last time, sold him into slavery. They took him to Egypt, the Ishmaelites or Midianites, whichever you want to call them. But the captain of Pharaoh's guard, Potiphar, was the man who bought him for his slave. But his advancement was not because of anything that Joseph, um, any kind of attitude he had of being better than anyone else. His advancement was because the Lord blessed him and used him. And so even working for a pagan, Joseph used godly wisdom, which gives us some encouragement. Even when we are doing work for people who are not Christian, we should still do it as unto the Lord. And our witness will speak for itself. And that's what was happening here. The Lord was with Joseph and made all he did prosper in his hand. And the Lord blessed all that Potiphar had as a result. And Potiphar just observes Joseph. And he discovers this is an honest man, a hardworking man. And so he trusts Joseph with everything. But Joseph was willing to allow God to use him. And resulted in God's blessings that even Potiphar recognized. Now, Joseph was an example of how, how every Christian really should, should treat their labor. If you look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, we see more support for this. Somebody read Colossians 3, verse 23, and tell us what that says. Right. When we work for a Christian or non-Christian, we should do it as though we're working for the Lord to set an example. And um, I saw one yesterday, and Logan, you can you can be proud of this one. I I went I went to a, a local place, and one of the lo young ladies who's a member of our church was working in there, and she. I think she did, she was fixing coffee, and I think she made five different coffees while another girl made one for me. <laughs> I got the wrong one. <laughs> but, and it was just, I mean, she was just moving constantly, setting an example before the others. And I thought, if this is the kind of example she sets and the other girls follow, I mean, guys, then they might have some success here. Because you know the expectation is that anything in Richmond County is going to fail, right? <laughs> that's, that's what we hear anyway a lot. But this, I could see how this would never um, suffer that fate if everyone had that same kind of work ethic, work attitude. And um, she even took time to smile and say hi. But, but she was hustling. 
So work as for the Lord and not men. So we don't goof off. We don't leave early or take longer breaks than we should or, or, or lunch hours than we should. Um, even when there's when it's not a pleasant place to work. When we witness bad things and bad language and 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 evil going on, we should try to set a good example. Now Joseph was very successful, the business manager, accountant, CFO, all rolled into one. But in verse six, we learn something that happened here in chapter thirty nine. Of Genesis. I'm sorry, not, not 39, not verse 6, verse 7. He was being tempted. This, this, this guard's uh, head guard, Potiphar, the, the head of the secret service for, for Pharaoh, I, I, he was married to a woman who was tempting Joseph. He was, according to verse 6, he was handsome. He was handsome in form and appearance. And the master's wife, in verse 7, cast longing eyes on him and said, lie with me. So she was tempting Joseph. And we have to learn to eliminate tempting situations. Um, Joseph, his good looks, his, his masculinity, didn't, it did not uh, escape Potiphar's wife. And no doubt Joseph was startled by Mrs. Potiphar's uh, advances. He, had he given in, she could be a formidable ally. But, had he rejected, she would be a vicious enemy. And he chose to refuse her advances. He was a man of integrity. He refused, and he reminds her that her husband has trusted him with everything he owns. And he tells her how kind her husband has been to him, has kept him and allowed him to have whatever he needed or wanted, has not, um, has not prevented him from being in charge of anything in the household. Yes. 17. Well, he was, you know, there, there were. It would have been a matter of weeks or months, I would think, because, because they had, um, uh, you know, they had bought the the Ishmaelites bought Joseph from his brothers. Um, you know, he was seventeen when he went out to check on his brothers, and they, of course, threw him in the pit, and the Ishmaelites bought him. They carried him to Egypt. I don't think that. That journey would have been more. And, and I'm not sure exactly how far they did travel to get there. But I don't think it would have been years. I think he would have still been in his 17th year at this point. That's a good question. Um, so according to verses 8 and 9 here in chapter 39, Joseph had... Um, a statement that he made to Potiphar's wife um, about why he couldn't fulfill her request. What What is that statement? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So as you get back in the place where you can eat, as you and his wife, how great can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? 
Wow. So, Joseph was not just being loyal to his master. He recognized that he would be sinning against God. This was the only thing that Potiphar kept from Joseph, was his wife. And Joseph refused to give in. It reminds me a little bit of the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. The one thing you can't have. They gave in to temptation. Joseph refused to give in. You know, he recognized his position. He had a high position. He was, he was well respected and greatly appreciated. And it's often when people feel like they've arrived that they're most vulnerable to temptation. When they feel like they're finally successful. Noah didn't give in to temptation until after the flood. David didn't fall into sin with Bathsheba until after he became king. And he led those weak, rivaling tribes of Israel to become one of the most powerful nations in that part of the world. And other times, the evil one tempts us very severely is when we take a big step in our spiritual lives. When we get closer to God, that's when Satan really turns on the attacks. If we're not close to God, Satan doesn't care because he's got us where he wants us already. But when we start getting close to God, when we start growing in our faith, that's when Satan turns on the heat. Immediately after Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended, and the voice of heaven said, what? Yeah, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And immediately after that, what happened? Yeah. Just after that big spiritual high, being baptized, you know, the beginnings, if you will, of his ministry, public ministry. Jesus is baptized. He is uh, affirmed by God through the Holy Spirit. And the very next thing we read is that he was led into the wilderness. And there he was tempted by the devil. Temptation is hard to resist when it's constant. The devil knows we're going to have weak moments. He knows that. So what he does is he keeps the pressure on. Just because we refuse to give in to temptation today doesn't mean we're through with temptation. It means it's going to get harder and harder. Satan's going to press harder and harder to try to get us to give in to temptation. So, verse 10, we see that Mrs. Potiphar tries to lure Joseph day by day into her bed. And not only does he refuse in verse 10, he says, I, I won't go to bed with you. I won't even lie down with you. I won't even be with you. In other words, he, he, he fled from her presence anytime she came around. That was his, his, what he told her he would do. That was his goal, just to, to not be with her. Not in her company. He effectively terminated the temptation. In 
just like that, we must avoid places, avoid situations that would lead us into temptation. If I have a problem with alcohol, I don't need to hang out at the bar. Okay? If I have a problem with, with drugs, I need to stay away from the people who use drugs and the places where they're being used and sold. If I have a problem with gambling, I need to stay away from the places where gambling is taking place. It's a very simple thing, but it's not easy to do. It's often much easier said than done. Finally, Potiphar's wife sees what she thinks is the perfect opportunity. She's at home, alone. Joseph is in the house. He's doing his work. And she, look at verse 12. We'll see what happened. She caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them saying, see, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to me to lie with me. And I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard it, or heard that I lifted my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. She set him up. She set him up. She grabbed a hold of his coat. When he left, she took his coat and made up a story. If we look at what happens in the Bible and, and we read in the Bible that all of our temptations are common is one of the things that, that we read. What we recognize is that there's, there's nothing new to sin. I mean, whatever sin we're tempted to, it's, it's been tempted of others. Others have been tempted as well. But the Bible also tells us that God is faithful. In 1 Corinthians 1 or 10, verse 13, that he will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. We, we tend to hear people say that the Bible says God will not give us more than we can bear. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we will not be tempted beyond what we can bear. That's right. Because if we read the rest of verse 13 in 1 Corinthians 10, it says that with temptation, God will provide a way of escape. We will be tempted, but God will provide a way of escape and will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. And so when we say it's just too great a temptation, I can't, I can't bear it. We're mistaken. God won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear and what he can help us escape. So we, we need to recognize that when we're committed to the Lord, he's going to always provide a way out. Sometimes it's just being able to say no. To turn and walk away. Other times, continued resistance is required. Sometimes radical action has to be taken. Like Joseph. We might have to just leave. To run. To flee. 
There are times when we might fall. Other times we might flee. Joseph didn't have a Bible, but Joseph knew God. And he knew God's heart. And so he knew that he should flee. The Bible tells us resist the devil, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And the same thing is true in, in, in resisting temptation. God will provide an escape. So, if you look at the next section, verses 13 through 23, we see that Joseph learned to concentrate on God's purpose. Um, Potiphar's wife was enraged. She didn't get what she wanted. She got instead Joseph's garment, so she tried to, to fashion a way, to figure a way that she could get even with Joseph for not giving in to her. He told the servants that he had tried to rape her, that when he, she screamed that he ran out of the house. And she kept his, his coat as evidence so that when Potiphar came home, she could tell him her lies. And she didn't even call Joseph by name when she was complaining to Potiphar. She said that Hebrew servant, she made him less than human. She, she, she made him out to be someone, a, a, a stranger, a foreigner. And she does this to imply that, that it's, in some ways, Potiphar's fault that this happened. Because she said, that Hebrew servant that you brought into our house. Catch that? Just like Adam said, you know, I didn't want to sin, but it was that, that woman you gave me, God. She led me to sin. So after hearing these lies, Potiphar became... Very angry. He didn't investigate the situation. He never heard Joseph's side of the story. So he threw Joseph instead in prison with all the other prisoners of the king. It was only because of the protection of the Lord that Potiphar didn't have him put to death. Executed. Joseph lost his position. He lost everything he had worked very hard for up to that moment. But the one thing he didn't lose was God's approval. God's love. God's grace. And that's because Joseph's heart would agree with Psalm 84.10. Somebody read Psalm 84.10. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Well, statement. I'd rather be a door, a doorkeeper for the Lord than to live in the fancy places with all the others, with all the high-ranking people, with all the popular people. To have the lowest position in the house of the Lord greater than any other position there is. The Lord was with Joseph in prison. The Bible tells us that Joseph gained favor with the warden. The 
because of the Lord's mercy and Joseph's honesty, integrity, Joseph was put in charge of the other prisoners. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what happens to him. Joseph, because of his character, is always promoted to a position of leadership. Because God was with Joseph. He became in charge of all the affairs of the prison. And despite the intentions of his brothers, despite the wrath of a, a powerful seductress, the Lord had a purpose for Joseph, and that purpose prevailed. Here's a wonderful example of a promise we find in the very first part of Psalm 138. Psalm 138, verse 8. Somebody read the first part of that verse. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The Lord will accomplish, or some versions say perfect, what concerns me. Because he's in charge of my life and I'm submitted to him, the Lord's going to take care of me. Whatever he has in, in mind for me to do, whatever his plan may be, he's going to take care of it. He's in charge. He always finishes what he begins in our lives. Somebody look up Philippians 1 verse 6 and read that for us. Being confident of this, of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Okay. So Paul is saying to the church, Philippi, I have great confidence that God's going to complete what he started in you. And God doesn't do things halfway, does he? And if he has a plan for your life and mine, and we submit to that plan, he's going to accomplish his goal. He's going to use us to do whatever it is he has in mind. Joseph was placed in charge of the prison. No more worries for the warden because the Lord has always given Joseph success even in bad situations, even when bad things happen to him. The Bible teaches that when we're tempted, we're not at the mercy of people. We're not at the mercy of pressure or passion. That there's only one thing that causes us to give in to temptation. And we find in James 1 14 that what that one thing is. James 1 verse 14. <laughs> By his own desires. Drawn away by his own desires. In other words, our worst enemy is who? Ourselves. The evil in our heart, the sin in our heart. We have that sin nature. It never goes away. It's always rearing its head and, and tempting us. And we give in to that based on our own desires. In other words, we can rely on the Lord to help us overcome temptation. Or we can give in to temptation. So yielding to temptation is really an inside job. It comes from within us. Something we do. So if we want to 
resist temptation. We need to emulate Joseph's integrity. Eliminate tempting situations. Flee. Avoid those things. And we need to concentrate on God's purpose. If I give in to this, how is it going to affect my fulfilling God's purpose? Is it going to sidetrack it? Or is it going to help? We know the answer. But if we're ever in doubt, that's how we can know. Questions, comments on this chapter? I know we didn't read every single verse. Yes? my testimony that I was raised when I was young and had a child and gave him up for adoption instead of having the abortion my mother wanted me to have. It was really tough to do that. And I was so tempted many times. To, to, I was, there, were time, there were many times I was tempted to give in, but I would not do it. I didn't, I wasn't thinking about God's purpose. I was only thinking that I love God and wanted to honor him. So there's another component hmm. to this. Okay. I mean, there, there are times when you, when your situation's so bad, you can't see that God has a purpose with your situation to turn it around and turn it into something good later. But, but it's, but you, I think in the, in that time, you just need to focus on loving Him and honoring Him because He loves you. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. And, and really, you know, you may not have been thinking about His purpose, but in, in essence, you were. You were fulfilling that purpose by being obedient, even if you didn't know what it was, because you loved him. Other comments, questions? If not, let's um, say thank you for joining us to those who've been with us online and um, we're going to say goodbye for now. We invite you to come every Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, for this Bible study time. And there's something going on for everyone in the family here at the church, all age groups. And um, also, Sunday mornings, we're here in person and you're welcome to join us. If you can't be here in person, Sunday morning or Wednesday night, we'll see you back here at the same place. Uh, 11 a.m. for worship on Sundays, 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. Thank you very much.